I never met Dr. Flitzman until tonight. I'm already calling him Bob, an absolutely delightful gentleman, but Art will tell you much more about him. Art? Hi. Um, for those who might not know me, my name is Art Flitzman, the director of our Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities. And on my behalf and on behalf of all of our members of something known as a program in genomics and ethics, we're just ecstatic to have Dr. Klitzman here tonight. This is his first visit to Milwaukee. The weather was fantastic. The art museum wings went up and down. Um, it was just a uh, very nice uh, day so far. So um, uh, Bob Klitzman um, is a professor of psychiatry in the College of Physicians and Surgeons in the Joseph Mailman School of Public Health. And he's the director of the Masters of Bioethics program at Columbia University. He co-founded and for five years co-directed the Center for Bioethics and has been director of the Ethics and Policy Corps of the HIV Center. He's concluded uh, research, uh, conducted research written about a variety of ethical issues in medicine uh, and public health. And he's written eight books, co-authored or authored over 100 articles and chapters. Um, he's drawn on qualitative as well as quantitative methodologies. His work has appeared in JAMA, in Science and Elsewhere. He's written for the New York Times, for Newsweek, The Nation, and other publications. His books include one which is the title of this talk tonight, Am I My Genes? Confronting Fate and Family Secrets in the Age of Genetic Testing. And he was interviewed earlier this morning uh, on WWM, and it will be broadcast tomorrow on Lake Effect about this topic. He also has written When Doctors Become Patients, also a year-long night tales of a medical internship, in a house of dreams and blasts, becoming a psychiatrist, being positive, the lives of men and women with HIV, and the trembling mountain, a personal account of coronal cannibals and mad cow disease, and finally, mortal secrets, truth and lies in the age of AIDS. I joked earlier today that other people write journal articles, and when Bob has an idea, he writes a book. Um, and, and, and quite good books they are. Um, so he's won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Aaron Don Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Commonwealth Fund, and the Hastings Center. And he is a gubernatorial appointee to the New York State Stem Cell Commission and a member of the Research Ethics Advisory Panel of the U.S. Department of Defense. And we're just so pleased to have to Milwaukee, Dr. Bob Kutzman. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a, a, a delight to be here in Milwaukee for the first time, and I want to thank Art and Bud and everyone for uh, inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as Art mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, in my mind genes confronting state and family secrets in the age of genetic testing, and uh, we all know this, but just so we're on the same page. Of course, uh, we humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome is basically bound up DNA, uh, which consists of the four uh, molecules or letters, actinine, thymine, cysteine, and guanine. Uh, and we have, uh, in the end, uh, three billion of these letters that make each of us. And just to give you an example, if this was a wall of books, say, this would be, there would be three billion letters in these books. And if I were to pull out one book, that's the amount by which we all differ. Right, so we differ, we're 99.99% the same, and it's the letters in that one book are what determine what hair color we have, what eye color we have, but also what predispositions for certain diseases we have, uh, what uh, uh, variants we have that may mean that for any given medical problem, I may need one medicine at one dose, and you may need another medication at another dose, and the person next to you get another. The reason that I think we're here tonight and that genetics is important is because of this slide. Uh, uh, Twelve years ago was the first time that the human genome was sequenced. It cost actually about one billion dollars. Uh, and over the following uh, 12, 13 years, uh, the price has plummeted from uh, one billion to 100 million to 10 million to one million dollars to 100,000 dollars to 10,000 dollars and it's now about a thousand dollars. So to sequence the one, three billion letters that make you is now about $1,000. To interpret it actually costs a little bit more because it takes time from genetic counselors and others. But as a result of that, more and more people are getting sequenced, more and more patients are, 
Uh, and there are large biobanks. I know that our medical center, and I think uh, most medical centers in the country, would love to build as big a biobank as they can that has as many people's geno uh, genomes as possible uh, for several reasons. One is we here talk about personalized medicine. Obviously, if we have a lot of this information, we can figure out what's best for you or your uh, first patient of the day or your second patient of the day. Uh, secondly, up until last year, uh, many people thought there's gold in them, their hills, uh, that you could patent a lot of things. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, issued its ruling about the Myriad patents about a year or so ago, in which it threw out half the patents that Myriad had for breast cancer genes. Uh, it did keep intact the other half of the patents. So there's still a lot of potential here uh, for patenting uh, findings that can lead to a lot of money. Uh, and of course, this could help science. If we have everyone's genome, we can figure out who gets uh, a particular cancer, what is in their genome that's not in everyone else's genome, etc. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there has been direct consumer marketing of tests, 23andMe most notoriously, which was founded by the wife of one of the founders of Google, uh, and for $99 up until about a year ago, uh, they said that they could tell you all kinds of medical information, take a more active role in managing your health. The FDA, about nine months ago or so, shut down the medical advertising portion of 23andMe. Uh, I think it was just false advertising that 23andMe was engaged in because, uh, in fact, they were not able to give very much uh, legitimate medical information. Uh, but they're still able to do ancestry testing, and I think they're going to be coming back. So suffice it to say, there's a lot more medical information that our patients are getting and that are going to be get, uh, will be getting. Part of the problem, however, is that people misunderstand genetics. Uh, uh, the understandings of genetics have increased enormously in the past 10, 13 years, uh, but there's still a lot of misunderstandings. So uh, one still sees uh, headlines like this. This is from 2011 in the Atlantic. British scientists find the fat gene. We saw ads for uh, the cancer gene, the intelligence gene. This is the cover of Time magazine, the IQ gene. At least they put in a question mark. Infidelity, it may be in our genes. The God gene, this is the cover of Time Magazine. The gay gene, this caption says, I've got the fat bastard gene. <laughs> if you read the New York Times, there was an article on Sunday that I tried to reproduce, I couldn't quite get it, uh, that uh, said uh, she has fashion in her DNA. Uh, so we still see things like this out there. And I think part of the reason is that there's been a long tradition in our culture, Western culture, of wanting to predict the future. The notion of the three fates, who were three Greek goddesses, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. One would uh, make the length, would make the yarn that would determine the length of our lives. One would measure it, and the third would cut it. Uh, and uh, we believe uh, in Western culture for centuries there have been beliefs in crystal balls and soothsayers and fortune tellers. If you walk down the street in Manhattan, every block or so you'll see someone with a sign out palm reading, for instance. People read their horoscopes. I'm sure everyone here knows what, whether they're a Gemini or an Aquarius or Cancer. And of course in newspapers it says, you know, where this means you'll fall in love today or don't make any investments. So people like to believe that there's information about them that's predictive about themselves. And genetics sort of fills this void to a certain degree. On the other hand, as I'll uh, come to, some is predictive, it's just that a lot is not. Another reason genetics is important, I would argue, is because there's a lot of talk of human enhancement. Uh, and at the same time, eugenics. Now, eugenics, one thinks of the Nazis, of having uh, decided that we're going to purify the German race. We know where, unfortunately, that led. But eugenics really started in the United States. Uh, it started in the Midwest, I'm afraid to say. It started in places like Kansas uh, in the 1920s when waves of immigrants from Southern Europe um, uh, and Eastern Europe started to come. There was a sense that we in America needed to protect our gene pool. We needed to have a pure gene pool, keep it really American. Uh, I would argue this uh, is echoed a little bit in recent debates about immigration, but that's another story. Um, and so in the 1920s, there was a lot written in America about eugenics, and Hitler unfortunately picked this up. Uh, we have done a lot of genetic engineering. We have monster cows. This is a genetically engineered cow. This is a genetic uh, modified salmon in the rear and a non-genetically modified salmon in the foreground. Uh, I 
I hate to say it, but what we just ate, uh, those of us who ate salmon may have eaten a genetically modified salmon, and the odds are when you go to your supermarket uh, that you're eating a lot of genetically modified food. Uh, so uh, tomatoes, squash, et cetera, et cetera, uh, corn, uh, these are all things uh, most of the crop in America is genetically modified at this point. Of course, this is another large issue out there. There's also cloning as is an issue. Uh, now, this is all very, uh, may seem very distant from our lives and from what we do as physicians, uh, but this has been a very active area of debate and policy, as many of you know. So the American College of Medical Genetics, ACMG, in March 2013, came out with recommendations and said that for all patients, all patients undergoing whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, for all these patients, labs should give physicians information about 56 genes for 23 disorders whether the patient wants it or not, and regardless of the patient's age. And these 56 genes are thought to be highly predictive and actionable. Uh, Lynch syndrome, for instance, but in this list is included breast cancer. So for any patient, if a patient goes in uh, for one kind of cancer and has whole genome sequencing done, uh, the lab is obligated, according to recommendations, to also say whether the patient has these other uh, uh, genes. Uh, there was some pushback, and so uh, patients uh, are now allowed to opt out if they want. But, but this is the kind of issue that's on the horizon. In other words, as more and more patients get whole genome testing because the price goes down to several hundred dollars, uh, there will be questions of what kind of information to give to our patients. And I would predict that in the near future, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, uh, that we as physicians will have on our computers in front of us uh, access to the whole genomes of our patients. And we can say, uh, if we press this button, we'll find out whether or not patients have genes associated with autism or with, with Alzheimer's. Another button may say uh, whether patients have, uh, are carriers for genes associated with autism, for instance. Um, another button, whether patients uh, have genes associated with breast cancer, et cetera. And I would argue this puts enormous responsibility and very difficult ethical questions before us. Uh, whether we should push these buttons, so to speak, what information we should give, who's going to explain the implications, the uncertainties, etc. Many questions remain. Uh, the ACMG did not uh, address questions about what about genetic markers that are highly predictive but not actionable, like Huntington's disease, right? So should labs give back Huntington's disease or not? Uh, what about markers that are moderately predictive but not actionable, like Alzheimer's disease? So we have genes associated with all time, Alzheimer's, uh, depending on your age, they may say that you have a 40% chance of getting Alzheimer's, partly depending on your family. Uh, should we give this kind of information? Who should decide? As I mentioned, informed consent is important, but requires time. Uh, I was involved in a study in Columbia where we interviewed researchers who were doing whole genome testing, and we asked, how long do you think it's reasonable to spend with a patient when you do whole genome testing? Most of the researchers, most of whom were physicians, said less than 30 minutes. Well, of course, if you're going to do whole genome testing on someone, look at all three billion uh, letters, so to speak, and you're going to find information about lots of diseases, I would argue you're going to need more than 30 minutes uh, to explain uh, to patients all the different choices. Do they want carrier information? Do they want just the actionable uh, um, markers, et cetera? Uh, and I would argue that uh, there are a lot of broader questions here about are we our genes? What does it mean? Uh, what do we, uh, do we want information about ourselves? Or do our patients want it? Which do, which don't? Uh, how do we and should we uh, understand genetic information? What should we do with it? Uh, and I think ultimately there are broader questions here. What does it mean that our genes may in fact affect key aspects of ourselves and the diseases that we get? How much are we in fact biological or biologically determined? And this of course gets into broader issues of nature versus nurture or nature versus environment. Uh, uh, what does it mean to be human? Should we enhance human? Should we alter mixed species? These are all issues that I think increasingly we're going to have to grapple with. So I was interested in these issues, and as Art said, I uh, wrote a book about it. I actually interviewed, I got funding from the NIH to interview a group of patients, individuals who were at risk of certain diseases. I focused on Huntington's, breast cancer, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, to understand uh, which of these patients decided to get genetic testing, which didn't, why they decided to do that, how they understood the information, whom they told, how it affected their lives, etc. 
Um, obviously, there are more common diseases like diabetes. You're less likely to be associated with definitive genetic tests. For each of these three diseases, there are uh, fairly definitive uh, tests. Other environmental factors, as I mentioned, may also be involved in the expression of genes. But I think understanding uh, real-life responses to existing genetic tests can be helpful in beginning to think through the issues that we're all going to have to face. So I thought I'd talk about some of what I found. And of course, uh, there's more in the book, et cetera. Uh, but individuals in brief who have or at risk of genetic disease face a series of dilemmas. So the, the first woman I interviewed actually was a woman at risk, who had breast cancer. And she said, you know, I always knew I should have stayed in that awful relationship all those years. I said, why is that? She said, well, that's why I have breast cancer. I said, but you have the mutation. She said, yeah, 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 but it was the stress of that awful relationship uh, that's what triggered it. And I always told myself I shouldn't have stayed in that relationship. Uh, the next woman I interviewed said, you know, it was that I was working for that awful boss. That's why I have breast cancer. Paraphrasing a little bit. Um, uh, I said, but you have the mutation. Yeah, yeah, but it was that awful boss and the stress, and I was living in that awful apartment, and that's why I had breast cancer. The next woman I interviewed was an African-American woman from the South Bronx who said, you know, it's all the crap that they dump in the landfills in the Bronx that they would never dump in Manhattan where the rich people live, the rich white people live. And in her mind, that's why she had breast cancer. And of course, all these stories may be true because the BRCA1 and 2 mutations confer about a 50% chance of developing breast cancer. So there are, in fact, other factors involved. But what struck me is that people needed to search for a narrative, a sort of a way of making sense of all this with their lives. And they drew on previous beliefs. So these beliefs, in turn, affected whether they got tested. If you don't think that it's genetic or that that's particularly important, you may not get testing of whom they told, what kind of treatment they decide to get, other reproductive choices they might make in other areas as well. So questions about testing. Uh, should you get tested? Uh, interestingly, the literature talked about uh, why people got tested when they came in the uh, genetic counselor's office. But what I found is that for years beforehand, people would debate testing. So for Huntington's, for instance, one woman said to me, you know, when I was in my yoga class, as long as I was, I was able to stand on one foot like everyone else, I assumed I would not get Huntington's, that I did not have the gene, that I was okay. Um, so people are looking in their everyday lives for evidence that they may or may not get something. Uh, they're making, uh, they're, whether they learn about their risk or not, people may not know their family histories, uh, people make self-assessments and assumptions. Uh, People obviously were interested in testing if there was something they could do about it medically. But what I found is that people also, unlike the ACMG recommendation, wanted to know if they felt there was something personally actionable about their genes. So people told me, for instance, about Huntington's, you know, if I know that I have the Huntington's mutation, I'm not going to save up all my money for a rainy day and go to med school or go to law school and have kids and raise a family. I'm going to move to Tahiti and be a musician. Uh, if I know my time is limited. So people make a lot of personal decisions. Now, a lot of uh, people said, you know, well, the genetic counselor said, well, are you the type that does better knowing? But how do I know if I'm the type that does, does better knowing with this kind of information? I've never had to face this information before. Uh, and that's a question that they then had to sort of figure out. It wasn't obvious to them. Now, why not get testing? Of course, there are fears of discrimination. So the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, protects health insurance, but does not affect life insurance or disability insurance or long-term care insurance. So if a disability insurer decides uh, when you apply that they want to know, have you ever had genetic testing or has anyone in your family had genetic testing? And if so, what the result is, that is within their legal rights to then ask that and then also decide that they're not going to cover you or they will increase your rates as a result. And it's a very difficult issue of knowing, obviously, uh, you uh, don't want people to go get testing and then disproportionately, when they know they have genes, go and get a lot of disability insurance. Uh, but you don't want to have uh, unfair discrimination either. And there's a question, as some of us were talking earlier, what is, uh, what is fair versus unfair discrimination in this realm? And there's a lot of input from others. So uh, what I found is that people say, when I ask why do you get genetic testing, people say, well, my doctor told me to, uh, which may be a good decision or not a good decision. Uh, there are questions of who to tell. So do you tell family members? Uh, people say, well, do I tell my 21-year-old daughter that I have a breast cancer mutation and she may get it and she may die from it? Is that too much information to give to her? Uh, when should I tell her? 
Some people I interviewed said that it was not until they were about to have kids that their mother said, you know, dad didn't fall down the stairs, actually he had Huntington's disease and, and you may have it, and your kids may have it. Uh, uh, parents uh, often felt quite guilty. People wondered, what if I haven't talked to my sister? I can't stand her. I haven't talked to her in 10 years. Do I really need to call her up and tell her, gee, I have the breast cancer mutation you need to get checked out? And there are questions about long lost relatives. Uh, people would say, you know, I have these, these relatives in Texas. I mean, my cousins, I've never seen them. I've never met them. Should I call them up and tell them I have the alpha 1 antitrypsin mutation? Uh, on the other hand, some people said that, you know, I got this email from some relative I never heard of in, you know, California who said, you know, we have this weird mutation we found. You should get yourself checked for it. And I did, and I had it. Now I'm on treatment for alpha, and I'm glad I did. So I think uh, uh, we may not be close to each other socially. Uh, and that may determine the, the degree of moral responsibility we feel toward each other. But I would argue genetics can change that. So that because of genetics, we may feel more connection responsibility to long lost relatives, so to speak. Uh, the question of when to tell, what to tell, how to tell, to get boarded out, etc. Do you test family members? Uh, people uh, said, well, uh, you, uh, my mother keeps telling me, uh, uh, that I should go get tested uh, because I have insurance and my other sister doesn't, I don't want to get tested. Or people would say, well, I tested for my kids to tell them and they don't want to get tested themselves. So uh, there's a lot of questions because, of course, genetic information, unlike, say, a cholesterol test, tells us information not just about ourselves but about other family members. Uh, and it's also permanent. You can adjust your cholesterol level. You can't get rid of a mutation, at least so far. Uh, interestingly, a lot of metaphysical questions came up, which surprised me in some ways. And why me? People said, is this, this woman said, it, am I my genes? Uh, is this fate? Am I doomed? Am I cursed? What does that mean? Uh, people would say, you know, why is it that I got the Huntington's mutation and my sister didn't? Uh, people would say, uh, when my sister found out that she had the mutation, someone said, you know, I felt terrible for her, but I was so relieved because it meant that I wouldn't get it. Uh, but why is that? Why did I, Why was I spared? Is it luck? Why was I lucky? Um, so uh, uh, people also need to assign blame. A number of people said, you know, I'm, I'm sort of mad at my parents that they gave me this mutation. I know that makes no sense. I wouldn't be here otherwise, but that's what I feel. Uh, similarly, a lot of parents, a number of people said, you know, I feel guilty if I pass this on to my kids. Uh, should I screen embryos? Should I, uh, what do I do? Should I not have kids? So I think issues of blame are there. Uh, people found it very hard to bring these different causes together. As I suggested earlier, people really want to believe it's the apartment, it's the bad relationship, it's a bad boss, it's something in the environment. It's very hard for people to understand, look, it's partly genetic, it's partly environmental, and partly lifestyle or diet or whatever else it may be. Uh, uh, and then people often had to change their beliefs. One woman said to me, uh, you know, it's very hard for me because I have breast cancer and I used to say, you know, it's because of the environment and pollution and now I find out I have the gene. Uh, I was such a big environmentalist, it's hard for me to change my attitude toward this. Uh, and there was also a sense of personal epidemiology. So people would say, one woman said, you know, I live in New Orleans. Everyone I know has cancer in New Orleans, so it must be something in the water. So people were trying to figure out why they had a mutation of disease and other people did or didn't. Or, why in a family, they're the ones who had a mutation, or et cetera, et cetera. I think people struggled with this. They looked for metaphors. Uh, there were questions of luck. What does that mean? Uh, again and again, I heard people say things like, uh, you know, why am I unlucky, or I was unlucky, or I was lucky, I did or didn't get it. So I looked in Medline, and that's interesting. What, what does luck mean? So I looked in Medline, I typed in the word luck, and I got hundreds of hits. Right, the, the word luck is in an unbelievable number of medical articles, or in their abstract, and yet none of them define it, I think about a hundred. Uh, they just use the term. Well, it turns out that uh, philosophers have looked at the meaning of luck, and some of us talked about this earlier. Uh, and in philosophy, uh, if uh, you're lucky or unlucky, it means that you are or are not morally responsible for something. If I was just unlucky, it means that I'm not personally responsible for what happens. I was just unlucky. Uh, anthropologists look at notions of luck uh, uh, to see how tribes use the term to make sense of unexplained, uncertain phenomena. Right? We're unlucky, it rained on us. It's unlucky we had a flood. Uh, and I would argue both of those sort of come into play here in genetics. There's a sense of, of responsibility or not for one's illness uh, playing into this, and there's also a sense of dealing with uncertainty. Um, 
uh, but these issues are there. There's also differences in toleration of ambiguity. Uh, so the poet John Keats famously uh, talked about negative capability. And he said that the ability to write poetry, you need to have the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time without yielding to one or the other. Uh, and it was very hard to do that. People wanted an answer. It was very hard to say, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that. And it's, it was very, a very difficult state to live in uncertainty like that. And so people wanted genetic answers, even though ultimately the answer was elusive. Uh, people wondered, am I a mutant? Am I sick? Am I predisposed? What does it mean? Uh, I found that people who had had major trauma in their lives, who had uh, had depression for a long time, who had been victims of abuse, often felt uh, you know, gee, I always knew there was something wrong with me. This sort of shows that there's something wrong with me, I'm a mutant. Uh, but for others, that was not so much the case. And there were misunderstandings. People said, well, if I have this, that means I'm not going to die of anything else. Lightning only strikes once. Um, uh, as I mentioned with the case of people with Huntington's disease who felt, well, if my sister or brother has it or doesn't, that means I'm therefore going to have it or not, based on whether they do it, not understanding that, of course, each flip of the coin is a unique toss. Uh, if I got heads last time, doesn't mean I'm going to get tails this time. Uh, and there were difficult health care decisions for each of these for breast cancer. Should I undergo prophylactic mastectomies and osterectomies? Uh, many patients felt physicians were a bit cavalier about that. Uh, and down from one antitrypsin deficiency, uh, you can go into as an enzyme deficiency, as some of you know, that often gets misdiagnosed as emphysema. Uh, people with doctors would say, well, you must have smoked. People say, well, I smoked a little bit 20 years ago, and, and it turned out, of course, it wasn't smoking, it was alpha uh, that uh, was the cause of this. They are eligible for lung and liver transplants. They'll often put themselves on many uh, organ transplant lists very early before they have any symptoms, knowing they will develop symptoms, so the game in the system, which raises some other issues. And then reproductive issues. So I was surprised that a number of people said, uh, you know, uh, I thought I would hear about issues of uh, discrimination, stigma, and people would say, well, you know, the biggest issue I face is should I have kids, should I adopt, should I abort, should I screen embryos, uh, uh, should I test fetuses and consider abortion? People, a number of people consider pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, screening embryos, uh, but there are questions for which indications. Uh, Huntington's is one thing to say I, I want to screen embryos to make sure, to test embryos to make sure none of them are Huntington's. Uh, but what about breast cancer, right? Some people felt, well, I've seen everyone in my family, all the women who've died of breast cancer, I'm going to screen the embryos. Uh, other people thought uh, the person could live for 40 years before they develop breast cancer. Uh, do I want to be engaged in engineering my children to that degree? And of course, by 40 years from now, when uh, she uh, develops breast cancer, if it's a she um, or he, uh, 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 there may be treatments. Um, so again, the people really wrestled with this. People said, you know, if I uh, uh, decide uh, to screen embryos for Huntington's disease, which I have, am I saying that my life was not worth living? That somehow I don't think uh, uh, it's worth living a life with this mutation, even though I've done that. What am I saying about myself? Uh, and uh, also, there are increasingly, of course, there are assistive reproductive technologies, and some of us were talking about this earlier, but people are buying and selling eggs, sperm, uh, there's now a company in California that's making and selling embryos, for instance. You can order an embryo up if you want. They have refrigerators full of them. Uh, and uh, people have to balance some more responsibilities here. Actually, what's quite interesting is, as some of you may know, there's only three countries in the world where you're, you are allowed to buy human eggs. India, Russia, and the United States. In all of Western Europe, it's illegal to buy and sell human eggs. Here we have a, a big business of it. There's, um, I should also pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. There are hundreds of websites, that, uh, menus. You get a Caucasian egg, Chinese egg, Hispanic egg, Japanese egg, Jewish egg, Islamic egg, etc. cetera. Uh, again, more drop-down menus. You can get a picture, height, weight, skin. You sort of pick what you want here for the egg you want to buy. Uh, there are photos. Uh, so it looks like an escort service. <laughs> but you see it says blondes on top of the bottom, they're brunettes, redheads below that, etc. Uh, so again, this is a whole other area in terms of what ways we can uh, uh, avoiding certain mutations if we want or getting others, uh, other genes. Uh, there are concerns about uh, insurance discrimination. I mentioned Gina. A lot of people don't trust laws. They say, uh, a few people said, you know, I have my health insurance now at my job. 
I can't stand my job, but my health insurance covers me. I'm afraid if I switch jobs, uh, I may not have coverage, for instance, with Alpha if you have expensive medications. Uh, and uh, there are also questions. Uh, in the Huntington's community, it is said, uh, do not tell the doctor that you have the Huntington mutation or, or at risk of it. Uh, and uh, you should go get tested on your own uh, and ask your doctor not to put it in the medical record. Uh, I think this raised a lot of uh, questions. Uh, other people tried to clean up their record. This one woman I interviewed said that uh, when she got tested, there were still paper records. Remember paper medical charts? Uh, and uh, she uh, went to the clinic uh, and uh, where she was seen, she asked to see her chart. Every page that had the word Huntington's disease, at risk of Huntington's, she ripped the pages out holding them up, put them in her pocket, gave the chart back. Uh, so again, I think uh, given fears of discrimination, there are concerns. Now, there is there is subtle discrimination I found. Uh, one uh, woman, for instance, uh, I mentioned this to a group earlier, uh, when she found out she had the proper mutation, she told a co-worker uh, and at the workplace. The next thing she knew, people were coming up to her and saying, how are you? Uh, Next thing she knew, uh, it was assumed that when the boss retired that she would become the head of the division. The boss retired and she was not made the head of the division, someone else was, she was passed over. And she feels it's because of uh, the fact that she had the mutation. Now she can't prove that, uh, she um, wasn't fired. Uh, so there's subtle discrimination that goes on. And of course, uh, we've had civil rights legislation for 50 years, there's still discrimination based on race. Um, so uh, discrimination, I think, uh, is there. Uh, it could be subtle. Uh, and then there's disclosing in the wider world. Uh, people say, you know, my boss said, don't tell me too much. I don't want to know. Uh, uh, I don't want to officially know. If you tell coworkers, uh, what do you do when you're dating? And people said, you know, I don't know. Do I tell someone on the first day? You know, my father had this uh, disease, this mutation. I may have it and may die from it. Our kids may have it and die from it. If you say it on the first date, there won't be a second date. Uh, if you wait too long, people may say, well, why didn't you tell me this? You're sort of hiding the truth. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of onus and responsibility on people to have this information about themselves. And it's often unclear who to tell. Uh, there are genetic communities. What's quite interesting is because genetics, uh, genetic diseases, uh, diseases for which there are definitive tests tend to be fairly rare, except for breast cancer, uh, People often uh, find they have a you know, George syndrome in their family or something, and they form online support groups, uh, which can be very powerful, uh, but also raise issues. Uh, uh, hearing about worst cases, how long to be involved, you stay anonymous, et cetera. Um, so I think that I can go on, but I thought I'd stop there and have time for questions and answers. I think uh, we need to uh, educate ourselves and our colleagues more about the number of issues coming down the pike. Uh, I think we've not kept up with the technology in terms of understanding how to integrate genetics into what we do as physicians, or what many of us do as physicians. I think we need much more public education. I think questions of biobanking remain huge. Uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, President Obama in 2011 released an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking uh, to revamp IRBs, uh, and there was a document with 74 questions he released. A third of the questions were about biobanking. Uh, if we have a biobank and we put information in, if I, uh, who should have access to that information? Uh, if I'm a researcher, I want to look at Huntington's disease, do I need to contact every patient and say, I now want to look at Huntington's disease about that sample you gave five years ago? Uh, when people, uh, when we put people's genetic information into the biobank, do we say we may do research on anything we decide to think about in the future? We don't even know what we're going to look at your sample for, we'll just look at it. Uh, is that sufficient? These are, these are uh, difficult questions. There were return of incidental findings. Uh, as I mentioned, issues of discrimination, patents are still up in the air. Uh, assisted reproductive technology is largely unregulated uh, by the government. It's, there's professional <coughs> regulation. As someone talked earlier, there's obviously the case of Optimum a few years ago, but there are egg, donor egg uh, brokers, for instance, online uh, that are buying and selling eggs. And these have implications for people avoiding disease, etc. Uh, and there's more need for research, I think. So, this is a copy of my book, uh, and there's a flyer you get a discount if you want. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd stop there and answer any questions you may have. And thank you very much again.
Dr. Fisher, so I have a question about reproduction. Yes. And this idea, intriguing at the end about if you know ahead of time of dating, has it just been tackled a little bit in some genetic communities like Jewish communities who have, as I understand, you'll, you, you may go get tested, you won't know the results, but there's kind of a matchmaking, you're not a good match, and then the relationship stops. Yes. So some of this has been tackled. Is there any other thoughts like this for this point? Yes. So the, uh, I didn't want to hear the question. So in the Orthodox Jewish community in New York particularly, uh, there is an, or an agency, an organization, uh, and this is a community that has arranged marriages. Uh, so if you're interested in marrying someone, you both submit a sample, and I may be number 25, and the person may be number 52, and they say, match or not match. And they're looking for a panel of a number of uh, uh, diseases, just case sacs that have a higher incidence in that community. Uh, so that's worked very well in that community. Uh, 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 I don't know of any other example of that. Uh, uh, whether that's a model for other communities is not clear. Uh, of course, that is it's a group in which there are very high rates of certain diseases because of, I don't want to say inbreeding, but there's been a small group that's intermarried quite a bit. Um, so I think this is an issue of, of what you're going forward with broader communities.